Hi, David. Hi, Brian. Right. I think we're all ready to go. Okay. And there are people watching, which is always a good sign. Always a bonus. So I think we may as well just get started. It's probably my mum, to be fair. So. No. <laughs> no. Right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this next Photon uh, live stream. Uh, Emmy, I can't make it tonight, so I am quite happily filling in uh, to speak to David. Um, and uh, just before we, sorry, I'm Brian Carroll, by the way, uh, from Photon. Uh, just before we start, um, I thought if some people hadn't spotted it, uh, I just update you that we've extended uh, for another few weeks, uh, well, until the 30th of June, the photography survey uh, 2020 that we've been running. Um, uh, there was no reason, actually, to stop it. It was a self-defined deadline, really, uh, but still with the aim in the autumn to uh, post all the results. But we've had um, over 200 responses so far, so we thought, why not? Keep it going until the end of June. And if as responses were still coming in, why stop it? So we'll keep it going for another few weeks. Uh, so hopefully um, gather a few more. If you haven't filled it in, I do encourage you, please go and add your voice and your opinions and your views to that. Because um, we intend to hold some conversations afterwards uh, about the findings on it and try and get as many, as many uh, more opinions and discussions going around what the findings came up with. So that's the that's the survey. But tonight is all about David Collier. Uh, uh, welcome, David. Um, Thanks for asking me. Very, very, very welcome. Um, I think it was uh, I think it was a must, really, because we'd had Glenn, uh, one of your colleagues, and that story will, will come out as we go, yeah, uh, on a few weeks back. Um, with his work, and uh, we're in that unique position, I think, in Wales, unless you know otherwise. No, I don't and, think so. I don't, yeah. I think that, you know, as far as I'm aware, it's the two of us, and, you know, Glenn's book arrived on my doormat today, and it's it's fantastic, really good work. So it's you know, for the for the two of us to be in such a small unit and to uh, to have made a body of work which, you know, if you listen to people in the know, is going to be uh, historically important, it's, it's been great. It's been, yeah. uh, it's been quite surreal, really. Yeah. But anyway, welcome and thanks for doing this. It's uh, much appreciated. No, you're, no, you're welcome. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the story of of, of your work. But um, that's David on Instagram. That's me on Photon. And my two personas off offline and Photon. Uh, but let's get straight into the work for this evening. Um, so the title was All Under Day's Work, and we'll come to the book as as we go through. But um. I think uh, I'll put up that first still, but do, could you just give us a, a quick overview, David, of who you are, how you get into photography, and how this kind of unique situation came yeah, up? Yeah, of course. So I'm, I'm an operating department practitioner working for the NHS, um, working at Neville Hall in Abergavenny in Wales. Uh, I've been there three years this month, or this week, in fact, and before that I was working in hospitals in Bristol, and my partner lives in Abergavenny, and uh, I hit 50 and just decided it was time to uh, take a slight step down the career ladder, because I was a band higher than I am at the moment, and uh, and come and move out to Wales and live with my partner. I've got two kids in Bristol, they're of the age that they were happy for me to, to make the move. Um, and really just sort of concentrate on having a life outside work. Um, and I've always been a photographer, you know, well, I said I've always been a photographer. I've been a photographer for 30 odd years. And uh, and I decided that I would have a, a good crack of the whip with that as well. And, uh, you know, so it's worked out incredibly well, really. But I, I cut my teeth in newspaper dark rooms uh, and, and with press photographers back in the uh, early to mid 80s um, my father was a newspaper editor and journalist so i spent oh, okay. a, spent a lot of my childhood uh, hanging out with the press snappers you know learning learning all the sort of vital skills in life which uh, you know I've, I've mentioned before on on sort of other interviews you know the important things for a 14 year old how to take photos how to roll your own cigarettes and how to buy a pint at a pub when you're underage you know, things, things that cynical old journalists can teach you. So, but I mean, you can probably see from my style that it's it's very much uh, an old school 
reportage style photography and I still shoot film. Um, you know, I, I shoot digital, but, but predominantly I shoot film. And I believe it was all film on this particular. It's all film, all in fact shot with uh, a tiny little Olympus XA3 camera, which uh, I could just put on a lanyard and stick inside my scrubs. I, I thought about shooting it on digital for, for ease really, but I made the decision about three, three and a half years ago to go back to shooting film. And I just thought, you know, I'd kind of be true to to my personal vision of photography and do it that way. So I was shooting film, and then every couple of days I'd come home and uh, process the film in the sink and scan the negatives. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that did. before this particular project then, I mean, was that the norm for you? Would you carry a, a camera at work? Uh, no, ne never at work. I mean, you know, I'd always have a phone on me, but but never to use as a camera at work you know there are there are very very strict protocols around taking photographs in hospitals so we were just really lucky that we got permission to actually shoot uh, the project that we did you know the management um from line managers all the way up to the ceo of the company you know of the trust were uh, were great you know they they could see that we had a vision to shoot this and uh, and fortunately you know most people knew our work already and and they they put their trust in us and uh, you know we we've, we've paid them back with dividends really it's uh, it's been mm. good well we'll talk about that more as as we go through but uh, I'll hand it over to you now so really I'll yeah. I'll drive the uh, the slides um, yeah, sure. but uh, yeah just take us through the story of the photograph okay so this photo is actually um, so looking from my left um, so uh, Dr Ferry. Um, is uh, a consultant anaesthetist. Um, Zoe Benetton, who sat in the middle, is um, she's a junior trainee anaesthetist, and that's actually me. Um, so obviously, I didn't take this photo. Um, Mary, who's one of my colleagues, I sort of handed her the camera, said, "This is how you use it. This is what I want you to shoot," and uh, and got the photo. So uh, it's just it's just nice. I mean, it's you can see that we're all sort of kind of enjoying each other's company. Um, you know, there's, there's a really good camaraderie in theatres. You know, I say in the book that, you know, we're very much a family. You know, we don't, we're not all best friends all the time. We don't all get on all the time. We're like a family. We fall out, we fall back in love with each other and and it's great. But I, I just like it. There's an intimacy in that photo. And I think that, that Mary captured that actually really well. Um, that was at the beginning of a case where we were waiting for a patient. We're in full red PPE, which is what we wear when we're dealing with any patient who either is COVID positive or any patient who's coming in for a general anaesthetic, we treat as um, as COVID positive, even, even if they're not. Uh, and so it's just incredibly oppressive to wear. And uh, one of the things that somebody who reviewed my book said about it was that it made them feel incredibly claustrophobic. Um, and I'm really pleased that they said that because that's exactly what it's like to work in that environment, wearing wearing that type of PPE. You know, it's uh, it's just it, it's really really oppressive. It's very very hot. You know, it restricts your breathing, it restricts your hearing. You can't hear what people are saying. Uh, it, it's quite a horrible experience, really. You know, notwithstanding all the psychological um, issues that you're dealing with around COVID as well. I mean, typically, day day to day, what I mean, your role is an operating department, department practitioner. practitioner. Yeah. What, what what is that? I mean, just... so it's it's quite a difficult role to explain, really. It's it's the type of role that people on the outside don't know about. A lot of people who work in hospitals don't know about. So, essentially, we are theatre specialists. Um, so we train. It's it's a, a sort of tripartisan approach to to the role in that we're trained to work on the anaesthetic side, on the scrub side of the operation, and then in the post-op recovery. Um, the majority of ODPs, not all, tend to sort of move towards the anaesthetic side, which is what I've done. I mean, for the first couple of years of my career, I worked in recovery as well. Um, but essentially, it's a really difficult role to explain, but I, I always say to people that it's kind of a bit like a cross between a specialist nurse and a paramedic in, in the sort of skill sets that we draw on. So, so we, in the anaesthetic role, work sort of hand in hand with the anaesthetist, managing the anaesthetic area, making sure that they've got everything they need, monitoring the patient, making sure that everything is safe. Uh, you know, the standard joke is that we're Robin to the anaesthetist's Batman. Really, right. So. And are, are you in theatre then? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We have an anaesthetic room and, and the theatre. So, yeah, we're, we're there all the time with the patient. Okay. 
another consultant underneath just drawing something up and uh and then sitting down on the right is uh sarah who's also an odp um very very tired at that point and i think we come to another photo of her later uh sarah was the odp that was on the front page of the guardian in the uh, in the photo that i had there um you know just sort of staring into the distance with a thousand yard stare on because just just shattered but again you know she's she's just taking taking the time to sort of gather her thoughts and, and get her energy up uh, still tired from the day before you know this was this was quite early in the morning um and waiting for a patient so the doctor here is uh, is just putting his his gloves on ready to um to go in and i think at that point so it looks like um he's probably getting ready to do a spinal anesthesia i think because he hasn't got the full face mask on at that point but, um but yeah again that that's in the anesthetic room and uh, and that's that's a fairly typical scene you know sarah looks shattered and you know we were all shattered all the time really it's uh, it's a, it's a really funny time in that we we're used to dealing on the anaesthetic side with the potential of there being emergencies so we're so we're trained to not only be proactive but to be re reactive to any to any emergency that happens so in some ways we're more um sort of well briefed dealing with this type of um crisis than some of our colleagues are because everything we do there's the element of you know something potentially can go wrong so so we're there as the, as, as the backstop to actually uh, to, to sort of put it right or to help put it right with the anaesthetist. Um, but the psychological pressures of dealing with COVID were that you never quite knew what was coming through the door. And there was always, although we trusted the PPE that we've got on, there's always this element that you're putting yourself at risk as well. Because, you know, we're watching people incredibly ill. We're watching people die from this, not just in our own immediate environment, but, you know, on the global scale. Yeah, there, there's the picture. That, that's Sarah again. Um, and that's the picture that I was really, really lucky to have on the front page of the Guardian. Um, so, so let's talk. Let's talk about that then. Did, did yeah. you did you pitch to the Guardian, or were you filing photographs? Well, I I pitched something completely different to the Guardian, actually. So I was taking photos of people in my streets um, during lockdown, and and as far as I'm aware, and as far as I was uh, led to believe by the Guardian, nobody else had pitched that to them. I was I was one of the first people in the country who was actually doing that. Uh, so they were very, very interested in that. And then, of course, you know, news being news, it develops very, very quickly. And all of a sudden, lots of other people, as is the way in photography, had the same idea at the same time. Um, and so that that became a story that really just kind of got put on the spike. But during the course of conversations with the picture editors of The Guardian, I'd mentioned that I was um, I was shooting this. And they were very, very interested and uh, and wanted to see some of the work. And as soon as they saw what I'd shot um they wanted to run with it and uh, and they said that they were going to give me an online photo essay uh this was happening simultaneously as, as as the book being published as well so yeah so so it kind of went quiet for a week i thought maybe they'd forgotten about it and uh, and then i got the email from them the day before it went live and they said they've got to put it in print as well so i um looked you know over breakfast at the online story in the morning and uh, cycled into work pulled up in the uh, in the local garage to pick up a copy of the guardian expecting to have a couple of columns you know two-thirds of the way through the paper and uh, pulled, up, pulled up to the newsstand on a bike and, and there i was or there sarah was and uh, almost fell off a bike so uh, yeah that was a bit crazy no great congratulations and that was the 6th of may wasn't it 6th of may so, yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, how is it now in terms of the the environment you're walking into? Say t you're back in tomorrow morning, aren't you? So, I mean, what, I am. What, what what's it uh, like now compared to when these were shot? So it's quieter now. Um, it's certainly plateaued. Uh, last I, I've been off for a couple of days. Last time I heard, um, all of the patients had left ITU and had been warded. Um, I understand down at the uh, the Royal Gwent, um, where my other half works, that they've had some new admissions into ITU. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel that, that we're in the eye of the hurricane at the moment. Yeah. Um, whether the second wave of the hurricane is going to be as uh, as virulent as the first, I couldn't tell you, but I, we're not out of the woods yet by any stretch, I don't think. Um, yeah. So we'll see. So yeah, we are. It's, it's a it's a it's a sort of funny environment at the moment, really, because we've we've stopped a lot of the elective operations that are going on. Um, you know, for better or for worse, we've lost um, all of the trauma operations that we did at Neville Hall have gone down to to the Royal Gwent. 
Um, you know, a lot of us think that they should come back. You know, there's, there's an awful lot of people that need operations that, that aren't getting them done because of COVID. So, so we're we're quieter than we are normally. You know, pre-COVID. But uh, you know, once, once it kicks off again, if, if it does, um, then we'll be busy again. I mean, roughly before the book, and we'll, yeah. we'll we'll come to the book. But how how far into this work were you, and and what prompted the book? Uh, so, so we both started shooting, um, just, you know, with a view of doing something with it afterwards. Um, you this know, is you and Glenn. Yeah, calling. Glenn and I, and just sort of having a look and see what, see what we could do really. Um, I, I had thought, of, I mean, my, my New Year's resolution last year and this year was to put a book out. Um, you know, I've got, a, I've got a sort of fairly vast catalog of work now and, and I've been thinking of putting a book out and, and you know, self publishing as a lot of people do these days and, uh, and then using that to tout to, um, to publishers. But I leaked a couple of, um, images onto social media, onto Instagram that, you know, were, were anonymous images. You, you couldn't tell who was in them at all. Um, and, uh, Pete focus from static age, um, zines publisher actually sort of got in touch with me. Uh, we, we've both been interviewed for a, for a, a different podcast by um, a guy called Flogger. Um, and uh, he, I'd, I'd sort of spoken to him in the past about putting a zine out and, and he said, look, I'm booked up for two years, but if you've, if you've got any ideas, by all means, pitch them to me and, uh, and we'll go from there. But he saw these photos that I put on Instagram and, and got in touch and said, do you fancy putting a zine out? And I went, yeah, yeah, it could do. It's not a bad idea. And he said that, you put about 20 photos in it maybe have you got enough to, to do that and i said yeah i've got about 120 that i'd be happy to publish so far and he kind of went oh okay right and could you send some through to me and let me have a look at them so i did so i just we transferred him a load of files that i had and uh he got back to me almost instantaneously and said look i think we need to do a book with this um I can't, I can't, okay yeah i'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to run with that well I'll be guided by you. I've never put a book out before. And he said, give me to the end of the week to uh, to put a draft together. And he got back to me by the end of that night. <laughs> I, th I think I think this was on a Tuesday. <laughs> and, yeah, God, absolutely. And, you know, by, I think I got an email from him at, at midnight with a PDF draft and just had a look at it. I thought, wow, this looks really good. You know, it looks like a proper book. <laughs> and uh, And so from there, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, within two days... This thing had been sent to the publishers uh, on pre-orders, and we sold out the first pr print run, or you know, on the pre-order within 12 hours. And uh, and so we made a second one live instantaneously, and that sold out within 36 hours. And we're now almost sold out. I think we're, we're more than two thirds of the way through uh, a third print run, which is three times as big as the uh, as the previous two. But he'd suggested giving all of the um, the profits. Um, you know, my 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 money from it, his money from it, and, and the printers would only do it at cost um, to the NHS. And, and I said, well, you know, the NHS is getting so much given to it at the moment anyway, it'll be a bit like, you know, a sort of drop of water in a bucket. So I think one of the areas that's going to really need uh, a lot of attention during this time is mental health issues because, you know, there's going to be an awful lot of fallout mm -hmm. from, from people suffering from lockdown and also, you know, almost like an element of PTSD from what some of the people have been dealing with um, with COVID. So I I suggested giving all the money to mental health charities. So everything from the book is, um, is being split between MIND and the um, Campaign Against Living Miserably or CALM, which is a, a, a charity which deals specifically with sort of trying to present, uh, prevent suicide in men under 45. Mm. So well, I think yeah, so far, for you. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're up around the, uh, over two grand now, I think, for, for those, uh, those charities. So great. So yeah, so it's really, really pleasing. Mm. So that, that's interesting. So three editions. For, what first two were a run of a hundred, hundred each, yeah, and, and, the, the, third. and the, the third is five hundred, and we're thinking we might do a um, a limited edition hardback. Um, the plan the plan was really that we were going to knock it on the head after three editions, but I, you know, I've still got interviews coming up with amateur photographer and and various other magazines and uh, and potentially a couple of big sort of international uh, analog photography magazines. So I think there will be the scope there to to extend the print run and do another one and are you still shooting at the moment i'm not i've taken a hiatus because we're kind of out of the covid period but once you know if it comes back again then i will will start shooting okay so I, back to that question i had how many 
roughly how many shots do you reckon you you'd had, or how many roles had you shot before the book? Then, uh, so before the book went in, I'd shot around about eight or nine roles, uh, and I think I'm up to about thirteen or fourteen or fifteen now. Okay. So, so not bad. I've had a pretty good hit rate actually from uh, from what I've shot. So, do you do your own processing? Yeah. Right. Kitchen sink contact, contact ki- sheets. Kitchen sink processor. Scan them with a digital scanner. So yeah, I use a plus tech. Um, I you know I use the old classic Paston tanks for uh, for um, for hand processing, and then um, and then I scan them on a plus tech, and that's it. Do digital contact sheets. Yeah. Mm. Okay, back into the forties then. Okay. This, this chat looks amazing. Andy, Andy the Australian anaesthetist. So, uh, yeah, so the reason he's wearing what he is is um, not everyone fits the um, the standard FFP3 masks. Um, you know, there, there are one or two that I, I, I struggled to actually fit. We, you know, we have quite a sort of vigorous fit test where we go through sort of sensitivity testing as well. And uh, Andy is uh, one of the people who um, didn't fit them. So uh, hence he's wearing a space suit. So I always make the joke to him that when you're that tall, you have to wear a spacesuit because your head's outside the Earth's atmosphere. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so that's why. So he wears. There's there's a couple of people that wear those, um, and uh, that's Jess on on the left, who is uh, one of the ODPs. And I'm not sure who the person on the right is because um, unfortunately everyone looks more or less the same when they've got a hat on and a mask on. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I think I think that's one of the recovery nurses who is uh, trying to get some information off Andy at the end of a case about a patient right so yeah uh so this is this is a story a, a um a photo which i will for the rest of my days kick myself didn't make it into the first edition of the book uh there's another version of this uh where you can see uh lauren's face in it um so the story behind this is I walked into theatre and it's at the end of the day, tidying up, throwing out the rubbish. And Lauren is so tired that basically she sat down in a box saying, you know, I'm just going to go to sleep here. And uh, and so I snapped, I just instinctively snapped the image and and then snapped it when she, uh, when she sat up. And uh, this is the image that almost everyone in the press, uh, in photography media, um other documentary photographers and photojournalists have said this is this is the image of the whole set this kind of sums up what it's like to be knackered and and, and just you know how how slightly crazy that the whole environment that we're working in is and uh, my uh, my mum was a nurse and uh, I was talking to her about this and and she said yeah th- this image for her actually <laughs> sums it up as well because she can remember what it was like being you know a young nurse and just how shattered you would be you know dealing with some of the things that you have to deal with and and lauren's one of the people that i really sort of take my hat off to because she only qualified this year along with sarah as well who was on the front page of the paper you know you got you know sort of uh gnarly old dogs like myself who've been been around the block several times and you know this is this this has been a challenge to us whereas you've got youngsters like Sarah and, and Lauren who literally have just qualified within the last 10 months and all of a sudden you know they're thrown into this absolute mm. maelstrom and uh, you know I mean what a baptism of fire mm. you know it's almost like being sent to the front line as a, mm. you know some sort of young ingenue really mm. and, and again sort of ramping that up you know we've got colleagues who you know like Lauren and but colleagues who are non-registered staff so you know the, the non-qualifieds as, the, as they're sort of glibly called who, who are the theatre runners and the nursing assistants and the theatre assistants We've suddenly had to make this step up and go into ITU and, you know, doing things that scare a lot of experienced nurses and practitioners who don't have ITU experience. So to, so to make that step and, uh, and go and do that, you know, I, I really salute them, take my hat off to them. I mean, I, I feel like I've been doing the stuff that I've been trained to do, really. So uh, to me, it's, you know, it's, it's not been without its stresses. But, you know, for those guys who are, who are going into ITU and, and, uh, and doing that, I mean, wow, you know, I, I salute them. I really do. I, I hope they get recognised for it. I mean, on that on that point, the with, with someone, I mean, you've got people that are visibly shattered. Yeah, totally. uh, and you you could say even professionally, being really challenged and perhaps afraid of looking vulnerable, not yeah. just to, to colleagues but to an audience. Let's say the Guardian, you know, yeah. a UK wide audience or a worldwide audience yeah. on the web. Um, 
how did we ask this question of Glenn permissions? Um, obviously, these people know you because it's colleagues, and in the main, it's colleagues you've stuck to shooting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Were, were I, they all willing to? to yeah, they were. They were really. I mean, yeah, there were there were there were a couple of people who didn't want their photos taken, and and you know we respected that. You know, there's there's no point in having 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 a battle with somebody over for having their photo taken. Um, but you know, after after a couple of days, people got totally used to having a camera put in their face, and and the XA is uh, is pretty discreet anyway. It's um it's it's not something you know it's not like you're walking in there with a big canon l lens and uh and it's it's very very obvious so so pe people were fine really i mean you know there were a couple of uh a couple of sort of joke comments about oh you've got me with too many chins or you haven't got my best side or why did you take me looking like that you know mm -hmm. but that's and, and my standard line to that was this is photojournalism not glamour so mm -hmm. it's uh but uh this photo i really like so that's Gemma standing up and wendy um and uh so wendy uh she, she's a very experienced ODP who, due to sort of family tragedy, missed out on a lot of the uh, the, the sort of what was going on with the COVID crisis and uh, and came back to work sort of later on in, in the whole sort of cycle. Uh, she's just dealt with a COVID case and has had a shower and uh, and Gemma is um, is obviously doing something with her hair, plaiting her hair. Nobody ever offered to do that to me, which <laughs> I, I don't understand why, but uh, I, I feel left out. No, this... Is that a real patient? Because his legs don't look well. Never mind. Nah. <laughs> no, so I didn't shoot any patients. That's a mannequin. Uh, I think he's called Carl. Uh, he costs about twice what I earn in a year. And uh, as uh, I joked to you earlier, very worryingly, he looks like a dead version of me. Um, <laughs> I've I've got a photo of him with my glasses on, and uh, it's. <laughs> It's really quite disconcerting. <laughs> the first time I actually saw him, I walked down the corridor and uh, he was lying there on, on a trolley in an anaesthetic room and uh, looking very much the worse for wear, if, if not dead, basically. And uh, one of the senior anaesthetists was uh, standing in there on his iPad doing something. And I just kind of walked in and went to, do you need a hand? <laughs> and he went, no, no, I'm fine. I said, are you sure you don't need a hand? And he went, yeah, no, I'm all right. I said, well, he doesn't look too well. He looks like he could probably do with something. And he went, oh, that's Carl. Have you not met him? I went, no. I went and looked at him. I thought, my God. And it's uncanny. I mean, he, I mean, I'll admit his legs aren't the best, but when you, when you see it, <laughs> when you see him from here up, I mean, you know, he's got everything that a middle-aged bloke has. You know, he's got sort of stray hairs coming out of here and bits coming out of there, and you know, it's it's worrying. It's really it's freaky. But yeah, he costs about twice as much as I earn in a year. So. <laughs> So what would the, what are your colleagues, what, what are they training on here? So they are practicing putting together and taking apart the, um, the airway equipment. So, um, so there was a special way of putting the endo endotracheal tube together in order to sort of minimize any, um, any sort of aerosol generating um, sort of vapors or generated vapors uh, coming out. So uh, it's just kind of familiarizing themselves with the new techniques and the new equipment that we would be using. Right. Uh, yeah, that's actually the first photo that I um, I leaked out onto um, social media and, and was spotted by the publisher. Uh, so that is a, uh, a doctor called Kartik, um, who was just putting some gloves on. Excuse me. And I just thought that's you know that's quite a good photo. I mean that's that's, that's kind of like the classic uh, medical photo. It's like a scene from Mash, isn't it? Mm. You know, the, the doctor will see you now. Mm. So it's. Um, yeah, I like that. I mean, I, I like the fact that it's, it's got a sort of bit of an anonymity to it as well, but you can quite clearly see uh, see mm. what's going on. You know? And also, you know, from from an aesthetic point of view, you know, as a photographer, I like the uh, the sort of geometric patterns on the apron where it's been folded as well. So that little, uh, if I remember correctly, the little Olympus camera, it's a little 35 mil compact, yeah. isn't it? Is that the yeah. one that the enclosure closes over the lens? Yeah, it's got it's the clamshell design. Yeah. So it's... Yeah. Uh, and it's literally just a, a zone focus point and shoot. Yeah. It's, uh, because, and what film were you, because I mean, the, the, grainy, the grainy makes it. Yeah. Yeah. Triax, Kodak Triax. Uh, and I pushed it to 800 ISO and, uh, and developed it in Rodinal. So it's got that classic old school photojournalistic grain to it. You know, it's almost, it's almost like, you know, the look that uh, Robert Kappa got on the D Day beaches. You know, every the grain is, is, is very, very much accentuated, which, really kind of adds to the foreboding in these pictures i think right yeah so. yeah and again that that's that's me that was taken by uh, a colleague um alan 
And again, I just sort of handed in the phone, handed in the camera, said, do you know how to use it? Do this with it, do that with it, catch me and frame me like this. And I was, I was absolutely shattered. I'd been um, about four or five hours in red PPE at that point, which again is, is sort of quite a conservative time compared to what some of my colleagues in ITU went through. But, uh, you know, I, I wasn't quite, a, you know, in a puddle of sweat on the floor, but I was pretty damn close you know i wasn't i wasn't sitting down for dramatic effect i was sitting down because i'm getting on a bit and i was, and I was feeling every minute of it really yeah and, uh you know funny enough i joke i joke in the book about you know we're all worried about our kidneys and you know i'm having having investigations on mine at the moment you know probably exacerbated to an extent by the fact that uh, you know we're just dehydrated all the time but it's uh yeah, it's uh, and this this was uh, that's another ODP on the left in the room and uh, and uh, one of the consultant anesthetists on the right who's just checking his bleep. His page has just gone off, and uh, that's in the day surgery unit, which had been turned into an overflow ITU. Um, so uh, so yeah, I was over there. I just I you know I like from, again from an aesthetic point of view, I like the uh, the sort of geometrical uh, division in mm. that one. So this. This photo I really like um, because it shows the tenderness between staff. And, and one of the things about working in an environment that we do is, is, you know, we're a really good team. We do bond together. You know, we always sort of refer to ourselves as, as you know, being like a family and the theatre family. And, and both Glenn and I have, have actually mentioned that in our books. And you can see that um, I think that's uh, Toya, who's one of the ODPs in the middle, is uh, having her PPE put on. And I think she's just about to go over to ITU to work in ITU. And uh, Marinor, who's one of the uh, one of the other scrub nurses, is is helping her by you know sorting her mask or sorting her hat out. And uh, somebody off uh, out of frame to the left is holding her hand and sort of pulling her. So there's a, there's there's that really sort of feeling of tenderness yeah. in that one as well i yeah. think which kind of shows who we are basically yeah. i mean you mentioned that uh you're sort of taking a, a hiatus at the moment as things have quite yeah. thoroughly... I mean, i've always got the camera on me and if something something i think needs shooting yeah. uh, appears i will shoot it but i'm yeah. not actually going out specifically to uh, to create a body of work at this particular time no but i wonder in that gap in your gap year um or <laughs> my sabbatical can i call it sabbatical now Is that yeah <laughs> uh, until the if we have a second wave let's see but um yeah. if the um if the book is out now in its third edition yeah uh has or are you taking the opportunity to think about how you would regroup and go back in uh obviously there's going to be different scenarios different Opportunities, Always. different setups, but I just wonder if you're concentrating on your colleagues and them working, them resting, uh, them getting ready. Uh, yeah. Are you thinking about certain new setups or framings that you might try going back into this? Yeah, potentially. I mean, I think because it's one of these things, I isn't think... it? In terms of laying out a book and sequencing in particular. Um, it's always better to have more than than, than less. But, um... Oh, totally, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I'm, like most photographers, I'm my own harshest critic. You know, you've got to be, because everyone else is going to critique your work. So you've got to put something out that you are entirely happy with. Um, I, I mean, I, it's really interesting. You know, when I look at the book, I'm very, very proud of what I achieved with it. Um, and... I kind of put it to one side for a couple of weeks and didn't look at it. And, I've, and with this, you know, interview in mind, uh, I've come back and had a look at it today, and, and I'm I'm really pleased with with some of the shots I've got. You know, there there are elements. There's there's one or two shots which I think are overly grainy, um, and and possibly I, I would have shot them in a slightly different way. Um, but yeah, but generally I'm happy with it. I think mm -hmm. it's uh, this this one. I like that. So this is this is one of the ones. So Carol, uh, who is uh, sitting at the front, obviously because Vince is at the back and he's not called Carol uh, for obvious reasons. Um, wasn't overly keen on this because it's it's not the most flattering shot of her. But I think it, again, it's one of those shots that uh, it shows how tired people are, but also. This is a coffee break and it shows the social distancing in action. So, you know, one person's having to sit outside the coffee room and we're all inside it with two metres between us. Mm. Um, 
so I think things like this kind of show uh, show who we are and what it's all been about. And the reason that I chose specifically to to point the camera back at the staff and effectively kind of back at myself was was that you know we're in this sort of weird sort of strange time at the moment where you know we've come out of four or five years of very very sort of tribalized political shenanigans in this country with brexit and then with the election and you know a lot of people have been banging the drum for the nhs sort of leading up to those issues and you know and what uh, and what needs to be done to it and then all of a sudden this comes along and people are out in the street on a thursday night or have been out in the street on a thursday night clapping and, and eulogizing nhs staff and uh, and holding us up as heroes and and it's not something that I subscribe to. You know, I mean, I, I go out and I clap because it, it's good manners. You know, my, my neighbours are clapping for me and my partner and the other key workers in the street. So it would be churlish to to not go out and show to show appreciation. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to humanise that that demographic that people are out um, applauding. And, you mm -hmm. know, I wanted, I wanted to show who we who we actually are as people and, and you know, and put a real face to us. You know, mm -hmm. we're not... You know, we're not sort of demigods or we're not heroes. You know, obviously there are some heroic acts that have been committed and people who've who've really stepped up to the mark. But, we're, you know, at the end of the day, we're just like uh, everybody else. We go to work and we do our job. You know, we do what we're, we do, what we're trained to do. And that, at the end of the day, is why I called the book All in the Day's Work. Yeah. You know, I wanted to show who we are. So this is my personal favourite photo. I like um, this one because it's pretty laid back. <laughs> it's totally it's totally laid back. And so Sadie putting her mascara on, having just uh, just come out of the shower and, and you know having done a done a case. And uh Pete who has just come in on uh, on the afternoon shift. Uh so they're kind of chalk and cheese. You know, Pete's um Pete's Pete's like me. He's from the southeast. He's a, he's a South Londoner. He's uh he's he's kind of like me to the nth degree. Um uh, he's been you know, doing doing this job uh, for longer than half of the colleagues have been alive. You know, including Sadie. Uh, you know, he's an ex uh, ex uh, army medic, ex police officer, but also in the TA. So he's been in theatre in Afghanistan, and you name it. And uh, and the Sadie, who's twenty five, so she's you know incredibly good, incredibly competent ODP at, at, at the other end of her career. Really, so you've got that real sort of a dichotomy between the two of them. Um, and you know, it's also you've got you've kind of got the white and the black there. Pete in his dark clothes, having just come in on his motorbike, and uh, and Sadie, you know, with sort of pale skin and the bag. So so it works from from an aesthetic point of view, but also you know you've just got that that real sort of juxtaposition between the two characters in it. And uh, I like the fact that Pete's down, Pete's standing there looking like he's a bouncer as well. Yeah, so, I uh, I've had the benefit of of seeing. Uh, there's another shot in the sequence, isn't there? Where I was thinking, what the hell is she doing? I know she's putting yeah. the scar on. Yeah. But her, she's using the camera and her mobile phone. She's using phone the, the camera middle, on her phone. Yeah. And it's exactly. in a bag. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So she's she'd probably be the first to admit that it wasn't her best ever application of mascara. So, uh, yeah. No, but it's so. little things like that, isn't it? That that's, that's normality the normality goes that's, on. That's the human touch, isn't it? That's that's yeah. what I that's what I wanted to achieve. And actually, uh, that that one shot for me epitomizes really what I set out to try and achieve with this project was just to, you know, to show who we are yeah, really. And yeah. just, just to show that we're, uh, we're, we're just normal people. Absolutely. Um, so maybe a special edition and a hardback yeah, coming, but um, I just wonder if, I mean, I asked you, you know, were you working on anything else? And you said, Oh, I can send you another still. Yeah. Yeah. Do. Um, no, and it's completely <laughs> different, but it has totally. raised some, it's raised some thoughts in my head. But describe the project first, David. So, um, so the project is called Your Own Personal Jesus. Um, so I'm I'm a complete muso. So a lot of my shots, I mean, are, are influenced by by lines from music or, or song titles. It's just it's just the way my brain works, you know. If I'm if I haven't got a camera in my hand, I've normally got a guitar in my hand, or I'm putting records on. Or, you know, I'm, I, I live for music. Um, so your own personal Jesus is the title of a Depeche Mode song from the '80s or early '90s. Uh, I'm not religious at all. It's you know, I was my my parents were churchgoers. Uh, I, I I went to church like a lot of people did. Uh, as a child, I, I even sung in the church choir for a while until I was uh, removed for, for lack of talent and inappropriate Dr. Martins and a, and a crew cut, I think. Um, but I'm really fascinated by religious 
symbolism and religious iconography and uh, you know religion over the last few years is something that's you know really sort of come to the fore particularly as we live in in a in a sort of a more and more sort of multi-ethnic multicultural society and multi-religious society um and so i kind of wanted to have a look at what religious symbolism meant to individuals and you know you look at this picture and we we are so used to seeing uh scenes of the crucifix of the, of the crucifixion and but you know it's absolutely barbaric. It's but it's something that is so ingrained in 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 modern contemporary Western culture. You know, people wearing crucifixes, people having pictures of Jesus um, or religious icons tattooed on themselves. But you know, I mean, this is this is about the most brutal thing that you could do to to a person. And so I'm, I'm kind of really sort of fascinated in in how people find comfort from absolute suffering. And I guess there is a kind of parallel to what i do professionally within healthcare as well you know do people find god do people seek solace in 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 sort of re religious comfort you know at times of great crisis i mean i'm i'm an atheist i don't think i would you know touch wood i've never been in that situation but i think i it, it's just something that fascinates me um and also you know from from a visual or a graphic point of view as well i mean it's it's a it's a fantastic project to shoot because it's, uh, you know, it's visually, it's a, it's, it's a real treat, isn't it? But this, this, th this situation, though, in you know, the whole um, coronavirus situation, the speed at which it's hit, not, yeah. not just this country, but the world. Um, uh, and you can see it from some of both your photographs and Glenn's, that um, it's full on just dealing with the immediacy of people's yeah. declining health, yeah. how quickly it happens. And the the whole thing about you know the, the vulnerable group being some the older uh, age group and people with medical conditions are likely to be some of those people that do cling to religion in totally. the form uh, as being almost central to their life. And this is the end of it, and yet you don't see any religious symbols because there isn't time, is there? If no. They don't make out the, the operating theatre, they're in ITU. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the time, actually, you know, when you see people coming in for operations or people in ITU, if they are of a religious persuasion, you know, whatever their religion, they often have trappings and, uh, and trinkets and sort of, symbols of their religious faith around um i worked in in you know the middle of bristol before i uh, before i came large afro-caribbean population and you would see it when when a lot of the older afro-caribbean patients came in particularly the women you know they would often sing they would often sing hymns when they came in you know pre-anesthetic you know mm. it was it was it was totally normal for people to come in and be be, be singing sort of spiritual songs and things like that one of the things about COVID is is it's actually sort of taken that away. People have been deprived of um, of having their relatives in, of having you know even the, the chaplain come in and 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 uh, sort of tend to their spiritual needs. And I always like to do things with my photography or anything in life really that challenge me personally. Um, and so for me, because I am an atheist and because I'm quite a strict atheist, I'm kind of almost sort of scientific in my uh, in my approach to religion it, it's it's not something i entertain so so it's a, it's kind of a challenge to myself to be objective about a subject as well and and i want to do this by actually talking to people and trying to get an understanding of 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 what it brings to them mm. you know at the end of the day i'm you know i i like people uh, you know i like my own company i always kind of describe myself as a sociable loner really but you know one of the one of the things that this this crisis has really uh, opened my eyes to is what we value in life and you know what's important and you know for so many people it's material trappings mm. and actually this has kind of turned turned that on its head you know as, as to the things that we value i mean it's silly little things that i've missed like going sitting in a coffee shop and having a coffee and uh, watching the world go by or mm. I, I for a few years i've been documenting the abergavenny market so just being able to wander into the market and 
and meet strangers and have conversations and take their photo or i'm obsessed with charity shops going into charity shops and because i collect photographic books as well and you know looking out for bargains and looking out for for books and records and things like that. it's just it's just the silly little things that 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 i miss but you know moving that onto a grander scale you know religion is something that's very very important in so many people's lives and actually they've been deprived of of their formal worship and going out and doing that. So it's just, you know, I think it's one of the big things that it's, it's kind of the, one of the big questions of the age that we're in, mm. you know, how you know, I, I just, it's just something that fascinates me. So I thought I would, uh, I would, I would kind of run with that and see, see, where I can go with it. Yeah. There's another photographer in Wales, uh, Matthew Einan, who we've had on here yeah. on a previous episode. Uh, he's one of his, he's a geologist um, okay. professionally, uh, but in his spare time, uh, he just always seems to be out with a camera. But one of his own personal projects that he's had running for the last couple of years now is uh, the faithful. And he's basically trying to document off his own back all of the different faiths. Okay, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if he's gone into the icons and the trinkets and the sim symbolism. Maybe he has. Um, he probably, he probably has. Literature that he's doing uh, a it's, lot of. It's, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, there's there are very few original ideas in photography and uh, but what you bring to, what you bring to it is your own personal slant on it yeah, and, yeah. and how you do it i mean i can't remember when, when we spoke yesterday um whether i told you this but i was uh, i got a slightly shirty instagram message from a um, photojournalism student in in south wales uh who suggested that i might have um been overly influenced by her work on doorstep photography and uh, and social distancing project and uh, and you know I think I think the word stolen was actually used and, and I just said to her look I've been doing this for thirty years and, and you know take a step back and realize that if you think you've had an original idea ten people have probably already had that idea but what you bring to it is your own personal interpretation. Yeah. Um, uh, you know that's it you know we all we all shoot the same thing you know it, it's like saying to somebody i shoot landscapes you're shooting landscapes you've uh you're you're copying me it's uh the whole thing about and i, I don't describe myself as an artist at all I, I i i kind of don't even think of myself as being particularly creative really i always think of myself as a documenter of of life but you know it's it's the nuances that you bring to your work that mm. that, that make you stand out as uh, as an artist in any field really and you know it's nice that somebody can look at your work and say you know that's a that's a that's by x or that's by y or you know that's mm. by uh by gym blogs around the corner if you if you can put your personal stamp on it and somebody can look at it and, uh, and identify what you do then i think you know you're you're doing a pretty good job really so well i we look forward to uh, you finding Jesus in all his various forms uh, <laughs> with the uh, with the new project. Yeah, my yeah. mum would, would fall off her chair if I found Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that, that's been great, and it'd be, it would be good to catch up. Just yeah, on, definitely. On how that project develop, project develops. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when when the brave new world arrives, and we can all actually uh, leave the comfort of our homes, we should all meet up for a pint as well and uh, chew yeah. chew the fat and talk photography and, and life beyond. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we're all relishing that. Uh, yeah, God, absolutely. Have a have a chat. But uh, thanks for that, David. So that's, no, that's on Instagram. Um, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, much appreciated. That's the book. At uh, ninety-two pages. That's not bad, is it? No, that's all right. Yeah. And actually, I mean, I think the the third edition, which I have in my hand now, is possibly even more. Actually, we put we put a few more pages in, so uh, it is. Oh no, it's ninety-two on that one. Yeah, so it was. Uh, yeah, but it's. I mean, it's a good. It's a good thick book. It's not quite it's A4 size. Not quite a telephone directory, but it's. Uh, no, good effort. And third edition, I think uh, that's great. It really is. Yeah. Too, too thick to roll up and swap flies with anyway. So it's a proper book, not a magazine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think we'll wrap it there. Thanks very much, David. That's, cool. All right, Brian. It's um, been a real pleasure. Yeah, and, uh, likewise. I've enjoyed it. Hopefully you don't get to shoot too many more of these. Uh, yeah, that, would, that, would, that would be nice. Yeah. And then, yeah. I can get, then I can get back to charity shopping and go to the market. Yeah. But um, no, kudos to uh, what you're doing. I think everyone's appreciating it. And, Cheers. Uh, Stay safe. I Thanks, think. mate. And hopefully speak to you soon in person. And thanks to everyone who watched. Cheers. Cheers then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.